Hello, welcome and good morning. Uh, 2018, when we were here for the Impact Failure Conference, I was not moderating a panel, I was in the panel. And I spoke so much that Harish decided that I have to remove him from the panel and make him moderator so that he is... <laughs> so, you know, this is the failure, right? Failure to balance uh, my priorities and limit to the time, I, have, I ended up becoming moderator. So this is also a <laughs> hint to all of you that you have to restrict to the eight minutes that, <laughs> that have been allocated. Jokes apart, innovation, enterprise and investment, these are so intricately related to each other and because th their history and origin is in the markets, and we are now increasingly seeing more innovation and entrepreneurship and investment which is apparently unintentionally or intentionally directed towards solving development sector problem that we tend to use the same metrics and the same playbook that was invented in Silicon Valley for venture capital in the development sector. Not only we tend to use the same metrics and the same benchmark and the same playbook for evaluation also, we want to use the same playbook that has been used in development sector forever. So on one hand, we struggle with the MLE people from the development sector who want to evaluate innovation, entrepreneurship and investment with the same benchmark, they traditionally evaluated charitable projects, but also the investment community that wants to see the same playbook of 80% IRR and six years payback, exit and also the unicorn terminology. So people working on innovation, entrepreneurship and investment in development sector is stuck between the two. On one hand, they have the capital pools which are used to a particular playbook and on the other hand, you have an evaluation community that's completely used to a different world. And that's where most of the failure happens and most of the time that failure is failure of communication and measuring the wrong metrics. I am really privileged today to have this wonderful panel. Elena, Jerry, Victoria and Chintan, they all come from different backgrounds, have engaged with innovation, investment and entrepreneurial ecosystem in some way or other during their careers and their practicing life. Uh, so I don't want to stand between them and you because the next time I know I will be out of moderation role as well. So without wasting any time, Elena, can I invite you? So last time I was here uh, in 2019 for the first edition of Impact Conclave, I was moderating a panel. So probably, <laughs> I wish you were questioning my questions to the panelists, uh, and this is why you moved me there. <laughs> so it's a pleasure being here, and um, I'm, uh, I, I was just uh, sharing uh, with uh, um, Martin from Doen uh, before that uh, I feel more comfortable talking about failure here very far from my country, so my investors don't hear me too loud. <laughs> but uh, um, I will share a little bit of my journey with you. And um, um, you know that a few months uh, back, uh, um, impact investing has reached uh, a milestone level, uh, the one trillion US dollar in impact investing. That was regarded as a tipping point uh, to secure the industry to get uh, mainstream uh, even faster and to catalyze uh, even more investment that has done uh, more resources uh, that has done uh, so far. So the question I've been asking myself uh, and that we should ask ourselves uh, is whether we should feel thrilled because of this achievement, because it's a huge achievement that has done in 12 years uh, despite the COVID, and I don't want to take it as an excuse, of course. But uh, looking at uh, what personally I've done in this space, uh, 
and uh, I'm uh, from Italy, the country that gave birth uh, metaphorically to impact investing because in 2007, uh, Rockefeller Foundation convened 100 people in Bellagio, in their center in Bellagio, and the impact investing world was coined. And I joined this, joined this space uh, almost immediately, and I regard myself as uh, an enthusiastic believer in impact investing. I have been an enthusiastic believer till now. And uh, in 2012, we established the Opus Foundation, a charitable impact vehicle uh, with the aim at supporting early stage enterprises in several geographies with flexible capital. The idea was to find uh, solutions uh, benefiting low-income people. And of course, I, I made the first, I think my first failure was that uh, I was in the sort of a syndrome of falling in love with all entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs I was meeting. And it was very difficult to understand that I wouldn't have to make a choice uh, only with my heart, my love, and my passion for this sector, but also with my thumb and my brain. And, uh, but it has been a fantastic uh, journey. It was, it was uh, 10 years of uh, feeling fulfilled, uh, making many investments. Uh, uh, the foundation uh, made uh, 40 investments, uh, more than 40 investments. We made uh, some exit, we made uh, some write-offs. So we enjoy the upside of uh, some uh, outstanding companies, and some of them are still in our active portfolio. Um, so we were so fulfilled and so rewarded that in 2019, we decided to set up an impact commercial fund. And the idea came because we wanted to scale up our experience. We wanted to scale up our track record. And uh, the first thing that I was asked by my limited partners was, uh, let's do fast, we wanted to invest you, um, but first you have to step down from the foundation, and of course that it was an obvious and legitimate request. And I, but I struggled to convince them to keep me in the board of the foundation, because I thought that my exposure to what the foundation was doing, I could benefit uh, my fund. And, uh, but it was a long conversation, so it, it took a longer to convince them that I could stay in the foundation than raising the 40 million uh, euro. And uh, the second request was uh, to look for other partners, general partners, with a background in private equity, Silicon Valley, and uh, uh, and that, again, uh, I think it was my second mistake because uh, I was in a rush and uh, I didn't really check uh, properly how much uh, my whole internal ecosystem, my partners, were really very much exposed and passionate about impact investing. And uh, the third failure, the third mistake was, was that, because I was in Europe, that I didn't talk too much about failure. And I stuck with my glossy numbers and the success stories, and that was because it was easy to raise money with this kind of a narrative. So after three years, and that was the kind of a narrative I had when I was pitching to them, of course I was very much a fence, I was flattering them with this idea of a gender lens. We had a beautiful uh, framework, uh, beautiful diagnostic tools. Uh, it was all in paper. But uh, everyone was uh, really very focused on saying, uh, okay, let's do it. Uh, I think we, they thought that it was a good narrative. So after three years, I can tell you that uh, I failed very much on that side. I'm the only woman in the board, so all my fellow board members are men, all my fellow partners are men, and uh, out for the deployment activity, only 20%, uh, sorry, only 20% uh, 
of uh, our deployed capital was allocated uh, in women-led uh, enterprises. Okay, let me switch. I told you that I'm not good in technology. So. Um, and uh, that, uh, I, and uh, I think that the reason why, why I failed, uh, I share with you, was uh, really the rush to uh, be able to raise the funds that were already there. And everyone was very keen to support uh, our scaling up activity because they have seen how good the foundation was doing. And so they say, let's do it commercially. But then they applied exactly the narrative and the language of the Silicon Valley. And by the way, I like very much zebras and are not unicorns, but I was not all the others share. So um, that, was, uh, I, uh, that is the reason why I'm not very much uh, thrilled uh, about impact investing, uh, flying high with these numbers, because I think uh, my personal failure mirrors, uh, to a certain extent, uh, a collective uh, failure in impact investing industry, where everyone is pretending uh, to emulate uh, what it has been done in uh, Silicon Valley, in private equity, in venture capital, and not really trying uh, and uh, making an effort uh, to find uh, its own narrative. Impact investing should have a different narrative. And this is why, from these uh, mistakes and failure, I then, uh, um, I was really very proud uh, to, um, to, to be stuck with a foundation uh, where our flexibility and our narrative is completely different. Uh, and so there, gender lens uh, is not just a narrative, uh, a nice narrative, uh, to fancy people, but it's really uh, the, the walk that, uh, uh, the talk that we walk. Thank you. Thank you, this is so inspiring and hard hitting. A uh, lot of lessons for all of us who are trying to understand how do we solve these problems. And if impact investment narrative is the same narrative as the mainstream venture capital narrative, in practice, not in marketing. In practice, if impact investing narrative is the same narrative as venture capital narrative, then do we need a further refinement in this capital spectrum that basically work for impact first, but doesn't mind receiving, plowing back returns in the system, creating a circularity of capital at some point of time, acknowledging the large potential of failure that will happen and will not be able to deliver the same numbers or the same metric that the pooled capital models really expect you to do, right? But this is a great segue to my question because you also talk, talked about the board. Jerry has been working on board uh, and governance issues for, 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 a, for a very long time. Uh, and in the board and governance, the failure of board and governance is less talked about. It's exactly when I will go to Victoria, the failure of design is less talked about. The blame is always on the either community or the implementation person down in the food chain. So I was actually planning to go to Victoria, but I'm taking a last minute call and going to Jerry because I want to get to the board before we go to the program design. Jerry, um, the um, failure of governance and the failure of board, you have been very eloquent about that. <coughs> Thank you. I, I know your throat is not in good shape, so. No, my throat isn't in good shape, and I'm caffeined up after a night flight, and I hope I get through to the end of this without too many coughing episodes. So if I, if I need to pause, um, <coughs> please bear with me. Um, I'll have my water on hand. And um, I am going to talk about failure of governance. It's a topic that's um, important and particularly important in my world, which is the world of social enterprises. Because social enterprises um, are entities that trade, um, but they have social and environmental purpose. So they're not exactly like commercial businesses. They're not exactly like charities that are non-trading. Um, they need a board skill set and board conduct and practice uh, that's between those two worlds. 
Now, my first full-time employment was in 1983, after university, and I've worked in the public sector and the social enterprise sector um, <coughs> over 39 years in 11 organizations. Um, I was founder of seven organizations, and, um, <coughs> and in the next slide, um, I'm going to uh, <coughs> just very briefly give you background before I rest and speak about my biggest failure, uh, which was in Special Eastern Scotland. Um, now, over 39 years, there's a lot of scope for failure and a lot of scope for success, and I hope um, you won't judge me too hard on the admission of the mistakes that I've made because we're, we're, we're here to learn. Um, I am going to focus mainly on the last one, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess um, Social Firms UK and Intermediary, there's a lesson in there actually. I stayed with that for 10 years from it being a project to incorporating um, advocating for enterprises for people with disabilities um, because the only option at the time in, in, in the face of very high unemployment for people with disabilities was large, sheltered, segregated workshops that kept people with disabilities away from society. After I left, it continued for 10 years. It should probably have only continued for five. It actually had achieved its mission very largely and stayed on uh, uh, because the board didn't recognize that it was mission achieved and they were in a crowded marketplace um, and should, should probably have closed earlier. Um, in 2004, I was asked to transform a print business in a mental health hospital. I employed a great manager. He did an absolutely fabulous job winning business, training and employing people who others deemed unfit for employment. He retired. I moved on. And a number of years later, I was really very saddened to hear that that business had closed due to fraud. Somebody inside the business had been falsifying accounting records, embezzling money, and by the time that was found out, um, it was too late to save the business. And the learning from that one for me was that many people think because you go to work in a social enterprise, you're dedicated to your social and environmental mission, there's, there's intrinsic values, which is around supporting people and, um, and, and doing well. And sometimes the systems that are in place, or that should be in place, uh, to prevent things like fraud aren't actually there. Um, so um, uh, I'm not sure, because I wasn't there at the time, uh, whether that was a system issue or whether it was a rogue issue. But around the world, every year, social enterprises close um, due to fraud and we need to have governance systems in social enterprises where board members are truly in touch um, uh, with, with the information and they're demanding of the leadership team to give them timely and accurate information um, particularly on financials. Um, I'm not going to mention Travel Matters, Social Value Lab, CIS, Ayrshire. Two of those are, 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 are still, um, still fortunately running. I am briefly going to mention Social Enterprise World Forum, uh, which started as a project in 2008. And it has grown in impact and ambition um, and is a global peak body for social enterprises. Now, we bootstrapped that in the, in the, in the early years. Very, very little cash, um, engaging with grassroots organizations um, uh, around the world. And <clears throat> today, we're fortunate to have an outstanding board, including Huda Jaffer from Selka Foundation. And our activity has gone beyond convening the social enterprise sector um, once a year to include social procurement, um, policy advocacy, uh, youth engagement, and um, yeah, and any of you who are interested in joining and attending a Social Enterprise World Forum, uh, we're in Amsterdam in October uh, next year. And a big shout out to Dune Foundation, uh, who, are, who are supporting um, in, in, in Amsterdam. Um, my biggest scar tissue was Specialist there in Scotland. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Specialist Turner, a Danish social enterprise with a very charismatic um, founder, Thorkel Sonne whose son has autism, who left his job in the communications industry to establish a software testing enterprise um, that would give employment um, <clears throat> uh, for people with autism, <laughs> like his son. Um, it is a great story, Specialist Learn in Denmark. Um, it was seeking a licensed partner because Thorkel's vision wasn't about one company in Copenhagen. It was about um, establishing a global network that would create one million jobs for people with autism. A very bold vision. Um, we had um, an extremely high-profile launch 
um, uh, BBC covered it. Um, all the newspapers in Scotland um, covered it. Um, and the host organization I was chief executive of, Community Enterprise in Scotland, at the time, was mature, it was connected, it was respected, um, it had a track record of, um, of supporting startups, it had a team of business advisors delivering business advice um, around the country. Uh, the finance minister attended the high profile launch um, and the recruitment began. Training was delivered by specialist Erna. Um, we had a French software testing company who undertook to employ all of the first intake of um, trainees with, with, with autism um, and life was wonderful. Um, until that software testing company um, hit a wobble um, just before they were due to employ our people and they left 40 of their own people, uh, their own testers go and they employed nobody. And we had too many eggs in that one company's basket and um, we actually never recovered from it. The business was burning cash. Um, it was in, we were in uh, a national recession. Um, <clears throat> rent and salaries were eroding um, uh, the capital that had come into the business. Um, yeah, sorry, the slides aren't, uh, aren't particularly visible. We had secured £750,000 um, of investment to start the business. 350000 of that was a loan and the rest were grants. So it put us in a really difficult position with the foundations, the lenders, the funders, the stakeholders, but most importantly, the people in the business um, whose hopes and dreams were tied up um, in this venture. Um, we replaced the manager. That had no real impact. We cut our costs. We were still burning cash. I spoke to the funders personally, and I spoke to my, my board, and we proposed a closure before the losses damaged the parent company that was the guarantor for the loan. Um, um, and I faced all the team, including the people with autism, and outlined what had happened and why, and um, closed the business. Um, there was less publicity at the closure than there was at the opening. Um, that didn't matter. Um, people felt this um, very personally. The organization I was chief executive of negotiated a repayment interest free of the 350,000 pounds that was due in loan over 10 years. So that finished on the 31st of March, 2022. Um, uh, their balance sheet was a bit damaged, but um, uh, it was quite, <clears throat> quite strong at the time, so um, uh, that, that wasn't that serious. So the publicity was gentle at, um, at the time, but it really hurt, and in terms of the reputational damage and the social capital that was lost, um, I certainly have never, um, never forgot that. Um, the, the lessons I've learned from it um, include when a board is spinning out, or when a company is spinning out a new enterprise, actually it's really, really important that the board members that are giving direction and the leadership team of that enterprise um, are exactly what um, that industry sector and what that opportunity actually needs. We had too many people with um, an interest in autism as our board, on our board, not enough people interested um, or with skills and market knowledge um, of winning contracts and, and software testing. One of the biggest governance failures that we discussed as a board um, was I had um, on the parent company board, Community Enterprise in Scotland, I had two people who were so commercially savvy. Um, uh, one was a head of retail banking for one of Scotland's biggest banks, and, and the other was from one of the top four accounting firms, both of them with incredible um, commercial knowledge and antennae, and they made great decisions. And they voiced on closure that they always had reservations. But they didn't articulate them at the time because the energy around the startup, the track record of the people who were involved in the startup, um, all of that was so strong and everybody else was so enthusiastic that this business was going to be part of a movement to create a million jobs for people with autism that they stayed much quieter than they had um, in uh, all sorts of other decisions in the previous 10 years that I had worked with them. So <clears throat> when you bring people with commercial expertise onto boards, they need to be pains in the backside. 
They need to be the people that raise the flags. They need to follow their instincts. They don't need to get soft on mission. They're on the board to use their expertise and their experience to help that board uh, make good decisions. I find that there's a real issue with um, uh, skills and culture on charity boards and, and the, uh, the, the impact on, on charity and social enterprise boards, that it can be really hard. Many people go on to boards of charities because <clears throat> it's philanthropic activity. They're giving back to community. They're contributing to society. People go on commercial boards for a whole range of other reasons. It's actually hard in the middle of this to get people on social enterprise boards that can give you the skill balance to make really good decisions um, in, 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 on social enterprise boards. And there's a role here, I think, for foundations to do more due diligence on the boards and its governance and its leadership, um, uh, especially on, on the culture of the organization um, in, in, in social enterprise, uh, in the social, across the social enterprise movement. One of the biggest learnings also was around replication. And this is my last point. Um, we were the second, um, or we were the first offshoot of Specialist Learn. In the world of business format franchising, they tell you that the second and third are the most difficult because that's the place where you find out whether the factors that led to a successful first business were the charisma of the leader, the location of the business, the market, and all of these variables that may not work in the second and third one. By the time you've done three, you know what you're doing. So we, we knew and we knowingly stepped into that hard place of, of second. Right now, Specialist Stern exists in many countries around the world, and it's inspired offshoots in many countries around the world. And to one extent, many of us who were involved at the time um, have no regrets around the vision, have no regrets about what we did, um, uh, but the way we went about it and the fact that we failed um, let some people down. So I think there's a role for <clears throat> social enterprises who are replicating to be realistic about it, to look at the business fran franchise format sector and to recognize that many franchises are established, ground up as franchises. They are going to have um, uh, rules about the percentage of your gross sales that you contribute to the parent franchise. You have to follow systems. Social enterprises aren't that good at following systems. Social enterprises are values led and they're flexible. There's, there's very little flexibility in, in the world of franchising where you're, following, uh, where you're following systems. So many social enterprises who want to have something in other countries, other regions, which resembles what they do, should actually have an, a non-franchised approach to it, should have, uh, should have a, a replication, uh, consulting, what, whatever based approach, but be really careful before you step in uh, to franchise systems. So <clears throat> my final message, I think, is on governance in social enterprises, is to get everyone to consider who should be in the room when big decisions are made. And if you look around your boards and you don't think that that board could withstand a crisis, you probably need to think about who, what skill mix and experience mix you want to be in the room uh, when those hard decisions need to be made. Thank you. So the governance and, 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 and the supervision and monitoring of the board is not only limited to listed companies which come under the SEBI or SEC regulation out of compliance but also a moral ethical obligation when you are receiving donor money or investor money to look after it for them in trust is it can only be ensured by an empowered and involved board and that means board needs to have visibility into the whole organization and board needs to have visibility into how the programs are designed rolled out implemented and how matrix communicated and the outcomes are communicated and that you know, I would like to now invite Victoria because of her extensive experience in program design and implementation and also understanding of upstream issues and not necessarily can be blamed downstream implementation. So, all yours. Thank you, Manuj, and really great to be here today. And as I start, I actually want to really uh, thank Elena and Jerry 
because I thought as AECF when we started thinking about how do we empower women that many years ago, we allowed for private sector companies to gather women during farmer days and count them and then come and say that, you know what, we've impacted 100, 200 women. And then many years later we said, no, it doesn't look like that. How many women actually have access to productive assets? How many women are making decisions? How many women are having their voice heard? Because it's about deep and meaningful impact. And when I joined ACF about three years and some months ago, it was actually out of a failure. The governance structure that we thought would have worked collapsed right on the face of the institution during a time of crisis. Listening to Jerry, I said, geez, as a CEO of AECF, I went in not because I had investment expertise, it was because we need to fix governance and compliance. Let's prioritize that, we'll see how business goes thereafter. And it was really about an African institution that had grown so rapidly and its governance systems did not advance to be able to support that particular growth. And it was painful. We were all over the papers in Sweden. If it was not for our funder at the time who stood to say, but the mission of the institution is valid, but there is so much to talk about as far as programmatic focus. This we can fix, we wouldn't be standing today. So also really for funders that choose to look at crisis situation and see an opportunity, we loud you. We don't take that for granted. We are stronger today because a crisis made us to rethink how the organization required to be run from a mix of competencies and really thinking about personalities. An activist out there will be an activist in the board. An investor out there will be an investor in the board. Too much crowding of one particular orientation will bring down, irrespective of what organize, a balance is so important. ACF was set up many years ago on this premise. Aid has failed. We need market-based approaches. So we were born out of the challenging of humanitarian approaches or aid approaches and saying, how can the private sector play better in the space of solving for development uh, challenges? We are a challenge fund, so we are gifted from very early on the openness to fail. Sitting here today and listening to Rohani especially and everyone else, I just thought, this is so much therapy for me. Even though my funders say I could fail up to 30%, I have never felt that I actually could fail. In fact, I'm the one who looked at reports and just think, no, are these metrics really looking like they are aligned with what the donor is expecting? And I will share very specifically, 417 businesses later, $300 million deployed across 26 countries in Sub-Sahara, Africa, Oh, we have failed a lot. Actually, I think we are the house of failures. Like, we can tell you everything, from technology to geography to, you know, what works for bottom of the pyramid in some context and what really doesn't work. But because of that failure, we actually have systemic change that we've been able to absorb. Today in the morning, uh, uh, Jerry was just mentioning uh, to me about one of the companies in East Africa, and I was just thinking about this, the off-grid solar market in East Africa today. If you go back to many of these companies, they have AECF somewhere as actually having offered catalytic capital. If we were unwilling to fail, we would not be here today. Can I just get the clicker? Uh, oh, thank you. So very quickly, um, so we had a program as AECF, it was REACT 1, and that was Renewable Energy and Adaptive Climate Technologies. And it had a mix of businesses from solar home systems, mini grids, um, you know, tech, uh, business models oriented towards forestry. Even those early times we were thinking about microcarbon systems way back from 2012. We onboarded 53 companies, and out of those 53 uh, companies, about 23 of them failed. Why? Because we finance at early stage. 
But we were not signing at that 40% failure rate, I might promise. We were hoping that at least, you know, nine out of 10 of them will really be open, you know, up to the end of the program. Uh, and really, why did we fail? It is because bringing in companies in a sector that was emerging at the time, we thought they just needed grant capital. Hey, here is money, go ahead, succeed. Then we realized that many of them had accountants who in Kenya, for example, have CPA 1 and CPA 2. Like, they just knew 1 plus 1 equals 2. These guys needed to figure financial models, capital structures. They didn't have the necessary expertise to, you know, be able to grow beyond this current capital. They did not have sales and marketing strategies. They did not even understand their addressable market. Did we ask them these questions? We did not. So what happened? 40% of the portfolio failed, but out of the 40%, guess what? 100% of them were locally owned businesses. And because the locally owned businesses didn't have the background that foreign owned businesses had, Yale, MRT, a network, someone who you can call just across and say, hey, dude, you know what? You have this expertise. Can you be on my board or can you be my co-founder? They also did not have the necessary expertise on how to mobilize additional capital. They did not even know that there was something called an ecosystem of investors, you know, VCs and whatever. They did not know. Now, um, okay, I need to, okay, this needs... And many years later, we're still failing, <laughs> you know, but we're doing better at it. We actually set up the AECF advisory studio where you don't have experts that are flying in to different capitals in Africa, support companies for two days or five days or a month. We have company, uh, experts who sit with the companies for a long period of time. You want a financial management expert? Your CPA guy can sit within the company, but you as a founder and your CPA person has this roving chief financial officer who supports you, is available for a year, for two years, and you can be able to have proper financial management within your organization and you're able to sustain growth. It's been, and it, w it really was because also, really someone was willing to say repurpose this capital because when I went and I said this is not working we really need full-time advisory experts sales and marketing mini greed experts all of these to be available to the companies for longer can you please support this and again our funder said yes so today we moved and we have react SSA one of our biggest programs a 62 million dollar program 87 companies, 66.4% of them are locally owned. As at now, only three of them have closed. Two fraud issues, which is really an issue Global South we need to solve for. Um, but it really shows that you know there's good progress. Then, 4% of all of our funding goes into technical assistance and 3% goes into investor readiness. Every design of our programs today, whenever we go to our funders, we say thank you for the capital, but in the absence of an advisory report, we can't take it because we know these businesses will take the money, the first disbursement, and then thereafter we can't disburse it to them because they can't achieve the milestones. But we have really a lot. 1.8 billion has been raised to the renewable energy sector um, uh, over, over the last couple of years. 91% of it went to 10 companies. 63% of it went to three companies. The three companies are all foreign-owned. There's such a big problem to solve for locally-owned enterprises that really are the players in a broader ecosystem and bring resilience. Local SMEs that are locally-owned if they industrialize, moving from importing from wherever to manufacture locally, assemble locally, it really will make a difference. For every one of us who is here today, as we fail, we learn. We must, however, learn. Why must we learn? The people who are relying on our expertise, on our commitment, are not seated in this room today. They are at home. They are cooking with wood fuel. They are at home, and some of them, their children, have been asked to get out of school for lack of school fees. 
Some of them are struggling to move their produce from the farm because it's rained too much and no means of transport can move their produce from where they are. There's so much work for us to do. We must continually be able to say, what will work for today's poor? How do we help them to be more resilient? Let's talk about failure and let's talk about failing learning and really making a difference for the people who so much need us today. Thank you, Victoria. And that conversation is starting from commercial investment and social investment with the gender lens investing to board and board governance and to investment and the way product design and stage appropriate capital at different stages becomes so important. By the way, I think there is 80 to 90% impact investing in India that only goes to series C and above. So it's not that the early stage startups are getting impact investing. And it's, I'm not surprised with the number that you have, right? Uh, that a major component of investment has been taken by all the big companies. And that happens in subsidies, that happens in investment, that happens in grants. Going to Chintan, who has been an academic researcher, has worked in the innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem of MIT and now running India's innovation uh, center uh, in, the, in the Niti Aayog. Uh, Chintan, you have like worked with very early stage researchers in academia. You have worked on translational side of research when you are translating R&D into products. You have worked on pilots and validations, and now you are building incubators and accelerators. Right? It's full spectrum, right? From being an academic to promoting entrepreneurship in India, uh, I'm sure you have a much larger spectrum of failure to talk about, especially in the context of innovation. So this is a nice time to get you on. Thank you, Manoj. Um, and uh, let's see. I do have a, I have failed all along the spectrum, so I could <laughs> have a very wide uh, canvas to talk about. But uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is, uh, well, I, I titled my uh, conversations, uh, symptoms of incubatitis. Um, these come, these come from uh, the uh, more uh, sort of uh, the experience of building innovation ecosystem, one incubator at a time. I must say before I go into this that the view uh, views I present are my personal views. They're not the views of the Niti Aayog nor the Atal Innovation Mission. These are my observations. Today or any time in the future when you listen to this and you feel like, oh gosh, this is about me, uh, I am also as much a part of this ecosystem as you, so this is about us and we are, we are all trying to improve. So, so <laughs> uh, let me start by saying that India is the third largest innovation ecosystem uh, today, right? With about 83,000 plus startups, uh, about 100 plus unicorns, about 107, more, about more than a million jobs created, uh, and so on. And fueling this success uh, are the 700 odd incubators, uh, public and private, that take an idea into a startup. They, they, they support an idea to get to a, a successful uh, startup. Uh, now, as you know, internationally, uh, many nations have decided that building these incubators is going to be one of our primary policy intervention into building the innovation ecosystem. And in India, the office that I work uh, with, Atul Innovation Mission, is tasked with the idea of creating and nurturing a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship across the length and breadth of the country. And many, uh, one of the uh, several things that we do is we build, we aspire to build world-class incubators across academia, industry, uh, community organizations, and so on. Now, in this process, uh, more recently, 
we uh, decided to uh, uh, create a framework to assess uh, the performance of these entities uh, along the input process output outcome uh, along with we created this along with the world bank and iit delhi and then we piloted it and here's what we found that one in seven incubators are excellent they can be world class incubators one in seven is a failure and then everybody else is in between these two, right? Now the question is this, uh, we as an entity put the same amount of rigor in selecting them, giving them resources and attention and all of that uh, uh, as an office, and then why are some succeeding so well and others uh, failing so uh, spectacularly, um, right? Uh, and, and, uh, uh, um, so, so this question uh, uh, led to a lot of conversation, and uh, what I'm uh, from this context, uh, what I want to share with you are six uh, behavioral pathologies: three on this uh, on the incubator side, and three on the government side, because you cannot quite clap with one hand. So. Uh, 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 let's, let's get into the setup a little bit. There are three institutional actors here. There's the government that is an office like ours. There is the host institution to which the incubator gets awarded. This may be a university, it may be an uh, industry player. Uh, and then there is the third institution, which is the incubator itself, which is created as a Section 8 con company under the host institution. Now, Section 8, for everybody's, you know, uh, to be on the same page, this is the not-for-profit institution with the for-profit transparency. That is uh, uh, transparency over for-profit. That is the uh, idea there. All three are there to serve uh, uh, the startup that is being nurtured, right? Uh, now, uh, uh, so, so, so from this perspective, we see that there are three uh, pathologies that hamper, uh, uh, the impair the incubators. The first one is not my baby-itis. This is a pathology where you award an incubator to an uh, institution, typically an academic institution. Uh, uh, the bo body, of the faculty body says that, listen, ac uh, 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 incubators and entrepreneurship cannot be a legitimate part of academic activity. They pay no attention to it, and this, uh, uh, this uh, thing fails, right? Now, can we expect to build a world-class innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem when we are, uh, when we are saying that in an academic institution, only the scholarship is the first class citizen and entrepreneurship is the second class citizen. We try to do as much due diligence as possible to get, get to the intention of the team that's uh, being awarded this incubator, but we are not fully successful yet. The second pathology, if the incubator succeeds at the other end of the spectrum, is only my baby iris. That is the, <laughs> here, uh, in an academic setting, it's one faculty or a group of small, small group of faculty who say that this is my baby and it is going to advance my interest in research. If, if it is in the uh, industrial setting, uh, the industry actor who was given public money because of their expertise in a given sector where the nation is trying to advance to build startups uh, for uh, the nation uh, turns this into their own R&D setup uh, uh, of which the output must first go to them. And in both cases, what was meant to be a public monsoon turns into a private scattered thunderstorm. The third uh, uh, pathology is must be through me, itis. We know very well that autonomy is directly and positively correlated with successes of incubators. If you allow an incubator to hire a uh, capable uh, CEO, a great team, and give them the uh, flexibility to be agile and respond to the market, that is what builds a great incubator. That being said, in many cases, for example, something as simple as a bill for a cup of coffee consumed by the CEO of the incubator, which is a Section 8 company, needs to be, uh, uh, it gets 
approved by the mighty vice chancellor of the university before they can be reimbursed. I am not kidding. OK? Can we expect to build an innovation ecosystem which is a quintessentially quintessential act of freedom through draconian controls? OK, let me turn to the government. <laughs> As I promised. Now I'll. I'll, I'll um, Someone else can talk. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this is the big picture. We are, as an agency, an agency like ours, and with our guidelines and all that, we sit at the intersection of two large spheres. One sphere is called the general financial rules of the government, of which the uh, purpose uh, uh, is accountability to public uh, money very for the right reasons. The other sphere is this big sphere of incubators and startups whose allegiance is to the market forces for the right reason. And, and, and we fully understand that a body like us needs to be agile so that we can deliver governance at startup speed. Here, three uh, pathologies arise. First, pure polycitis. This is when people who are building innovation ecosystem, uh, they, they say that I, oh, my only concern is strict adherence to the guidelines and nothing else. We know from best of the investors that they do rigorous due diligence before they invest, but after they invest, they to be successful. We, I have not yet embraced that wisdom wholeheartedly. Second one, must be profitable itis. Now, we fund startups that no one else would want to fund because they are risky. Even so, when we have to give disperse money, we have to we have to sort of wrestle with uh, people who ask us question: Is this entity profitable? Now, you see, many of you, know, who, 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 many of you who work with the governments know that most of government transactions like contracts and procurement and all of that happens with somebody who is profitable and has a reasonable, uh, sound track record. If such a startup had those two things, why would they take government money? Listen, Amazon.com, what was it, 19 years? They were not profitable. The question is, can we build the innovation ecosystem, which is the only, mind you, the only platform in this nation that promotes risk taking through extreme risk aversion? <laughs> the final pathology, private sector nervositis. When you have one, when you have part of money to be given to one institution and there are two deserving candidates, equally deserving, one private and one public, you still hear an opinion that I am more comfortable giving money to the public institution. Why? Uh, we have, for our assessment shows that several private incubators are more hungry for, to learn and grow. We also know that many of our grand challenges, health, agriculture, energy, climate, whatever, pick your best, pick your favorite, are not going to be solved through public exchequer alone. Then, why are we hesitating to consider private sector an equal partner? Okay, you might say, this is all gloom and doom and I'm very negative and all that. Not at all. I, on, to the contrary, I am very bullish. Our, in the next 10 years, our innovation ecosystem will grow 10 times. But we will have to overcome these pathologies in order for it to have, do so. Thank you. It rarely happens when public sector executives do the work of private sector on a stage where representatives from various parts of the society are there. So thank you for highlighting what we all talk about all the time. Awesome. 
Great. Thank you.